Great. Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Will. And I'm going to be talking about graph analysis of Russian Twitter trolls. Uh, so the, the idea here is really to provide a sort of an overview of graph databases and specifically Neo4j, which is an open source graph database, uh, but in the context of a specific data set uh, with data on Russian Twitter trolls. And we'll talk a bit more about what this data set is uh, in a minute. So this is me. Um, I'm a developer at Neo4j. Uh, Neo4j is an open source graph database. I'm curious, how many people have heard of, of Neo4j or, or use Neo4j? A few folks? Okay. <laughs> okay, <laughs> cool. Um, so I, I work on the developer relations team at Neo. Uh, I spend most of my time building integrations, so I don't work on the core database itself. Instead, I work on tooling around the database, so making sure you can use Neo4j with your favorite web development framework. There's tooling for moving data back and forth between different processing frameworks, things like that. Uh, my current project is working on a GraphQL integration. Uh, so if anyone wants to, to chat about that, I'd love to as well. Uh, but I also run what we call the Neo4j Data Journalism Accelerator Program. And the, the goal of this program is to provide some technical resources, some folks like me, uh, to work directly with data journalists who are working with data sets that are often complex and connected data that uh, lend themselves to be analyzed with a graph database. Um, so the, the project we're going to talk about today is one of the more recent projects that I worked on as part of this data journalism uh, program uh, with Neo4j. And this was a project that we worked on with a team at NBC News, uh, specifically looking at Russian troll data. And there, there are a few articles that they published. Um, ben Popkin was the, the main writer that we worked with on this. But first of all, um, let me give just sort of a, a brief overview of what a graph database is and talk a little bit about Neo4j specifically, and, and then we'll dive into the data a bit. So since we're talking about Twitter data, I think the best way to sort of summarize Neo4j is in the form of a tweet. So here's Neo4j in 140 characters. I guess I could use 280 now. Uh, I can expand this a bit. Uh, but Neo4j, open source software that stores and queries data as nodes and relationships using the Cypher query language with index-free adjacency. OK, so let's, let's dissect that a little bit. So first of all, Neo4j is, is open source. That means all the code's on GitHub. You can build it from source. Lots of, lots of ways to get, to get started with it. Uh, Neo4j is primarily a database. So it's a transactional database focused on data durability. So when a transaction is committed, uh, that data is safe. And Neo4j allows us to store and query our data as nodes and relationships. So we use what's called the property graph uh, data model with Neo4j. So nodes are the entities in the graph and relationships connect them. We can store arbitrary key value pair properties as attributes on both nodes and relationships. This data model uh, comes from another data journalism project uh, called the, the Paradise Papers. So this was a uh, leaked data set of offshore corporations and the people connected to them. Uh, there were lots of influential people and companies that were found in this data. Uh, so this made lots of, of interesting headlines as well. And the, the data journalists that were working with this data used Neo4j to make sense of this data. Uh, and this is the data model that, that they used. So here we have entities. These are the offshore corporations. Uh, they're connected to officer nodes. These are the actual people that are either a shareholder, beneficiary of, of the company. Uh, and then we have intermediary nodes. These are the law firms that registered these legal entities on behalf of the officer. And they're all connected to address nodes. So that's the, the basic data model uh, for this example. OK, so on to the next part of our tweet here. So, we're storing and querying our data as nodes and relationships using the Cypher query language. 
so at the top there is an example of Cypher. You can think of Cypher as SQL, but for graphs. So Cypher is very much about pattern matching. So in that first match statement, we're expressing a graph pattern with this sort of ASCII art notation. So nodes are within parentheses, relationships within brackets. Um, and then we're doing, uh, we're doing a, a where predicate filter here. So you can see we have some similar semantics to what you would see in SQL. And what this pattern is saying is find all of the address nodes uh, where the address property contains Palo Alto. And then traverse out from those address nodes to find uh, all of the officers, so find all of the people with an address in Palo Alto. And then from those officer nodes, traverse out to find the entity nodes, to find the, the offshore corporations that they're connected to. So if we were to run this query uh, against the Paradise Papers data set in Neo4j browser, Neo4j browser is like a, a query workbench uh, for exploring data in Neo4j, we would get a graph visualization that looks like this. So we can explore the data visually as a graph. We see a, a few sort of more connected clusters in here that might be interesting uh, to explore. But sometimes the, the answer to our question is the result of an aggregation. It's not graph data. Uh, sometimes it's just tabular data. So here's a, a slightly different version of that query. Uh, this time, we're doing a group by on uh, jurisdiction. So now we're saying, OK, for everyone with an address in Palo Alto that has an offshore company that showed up in the Paradise Papers, what are the most popular offshore jurisdictions that they use to register those companies? Sorry, what is the group by operator? So the, the group by, it, it's really sort of an implicit uh, group by. So anytime we return something along with the result of an aggregation, so here count is the, the aggregation function, uh, we have an implicit group by with whatever we're returning it with. And there are two different operators for traverse. One looks like a less than dash, and the other looks like uh, a yeah, yeah. forward. Yeah, that, that's a good point. So, um, so we have we have a way to express a pattern uh, sort of as completely as we want to um, on on sort of the left side of the officer node here. Uh, we've specified a relationship type within uh, within brackets. So that means we're only going to traverse this uh, registered address relationship type. Uh, to the right of the officer node, we just have two dashes. Uh, so we're not specifying the type of the relationship to follow, which means we'll follow any relationship in that direction. So this, this arrow here is indicating the direction uh, to follow. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and so similarly, we've specified, after the colon here, we've specified the node label to match on. Um, we, we don't have to specify the label. Um, and then the, the thing before the colon, this becomes an alias or a variable that we can refer to later. Yeah? I would imagine the databases that you're working from are filled with errors, filled with incompletenesses. So I would have expected that statistics and, and of incompleteness and inaccuracy would be central. And it's quite surprising to me, therefore, to see you doing something that does not have that in an, in an intrinsic way. Um, yeah, so there's, you know, like, like other databases and, and other sort of data operation, there's a bit of, of data cleaning that goes on before you're ready to sort of insert that into the database. Um, so, so for example, um, for address, we may have many different uh, formats of the address. We have m many different sort of misspellings, that kind of thing. We've done, we can assume that we've done sort of a pre-processing step uh, before we've imported the data. If you were a bank looking at mortgages in, 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 in Santa Clara County, I could believe that you could get an almost clean data set. But in something like this, when I think of detective journalists, I would expect that dirty data is fundamental to, to everything that you're doing. Yeah, th absolutely. That, that, that's a really big problem. Um, this, this data came from leaked documents in lots of different formats, right? So it, it came from 
reconstructed SQL dumps from a, a CRM system. It came from things that were extracted from PDFs. It came from things that were extracted from emails, uh, both manually and with automated tooling. So the, there's no sort of magic tool here to, to get around that, that sort of uh, data cleansing process. That's, that's a, a very common problem. Yep. Other question? Cool. Um, so, so sometimes the uh, the answer to our question is uh, tabular data, right? So, so here we want to know, okay, what are the most popular uh, offshore jurisdictions for people with an address in, in Palo Alto? So, because we're not returning graph data here, we're returning uh, scalars. Uh, we get a table, so we can see that the British Virgin Islands is the most common offshore jurisdiction. Uh, for people with an address in Palo Alto, followed by Bermuda, uh, undetermined. So we have some, some dirty data. We're missing some fields here. Um, so let's, let's talk a little bit about how we use Cypher to build applications. Uh, well, typically, we would use one of the, the client driver libraries for Neo4j uh, that we would bring into our application. Um, the client drivers send parameterized Cypher queries, uh, basically as, as strings, to the database. And they handle the responses in a streaming format over what's called the Bolt protocol. Uh, so the Bolt protocol is a proprietary protocol for Neo4j um, that we use for sending data uh, back and forth to, to the client drivers. Uh, there are lots of benefits uh, of Bolt. Previously, we, we used uh, JSON over HTTP. Um, but with Bolt, we have a unified type system. Uh, so one of the problems with working with, with JSON in different languages is that there's no uh, sort of standard type system for working with, uh, with JSON data. Uh, and then also, Bolt is stateful. So it maintains a connection to the database. So we only have to send uh, authorization once. Uh, and the serialization uh, format is much more tightly coupled to the database types in the database. So, uh, so that's the reason we, we use Bolt, and, and we have a lot of benefits there. So here's an example. Um, this is some JavaScript code. Uh, basically, we're creating a connection to, uh, to the database. We're then issuing a Cypher query. Uh, this one says, find me all of the addresses uh, that have a latitude and longitude, and then find uh, basically everyone that's connected to those and what uh, legal entities are they connected to. Uh, and then here, this is sort of the, the callback. Uh, anytime we, we get back a record, so we're getting back a stream of records, anytime we have a, a record, we're uh, adding a marker to a map. And then uh, when this is all completed, we, we show the map and close the session. So this, this comes from uh, a little visualization tool that I built to give you a heat map of the Paradise Papers addresses. Uh, so, so what's going on here? Well, we can see that there are a lot of addresses sort of on the, on the East Coast. There's a lot uh, of concentration going on in the Caribbean. Um, if I'm on the Wi-Fi, this should should load here. There we go. Uh, and, and so this is sort of, this is an interactive tool. It basically, it, it's just demonstrating how we build an application with, with Neo4j. Um, we can explore the, the Bay Area uh, if we want to. We can actually zoom in on those, those Palo Alto addresses. <laughs> I will leave that for, uh, for uh, your use at home. Okay, so um, so all the code for that's online. That that demo's online. Feel free to to play around with it. Um, so Cipher is, is an open source query language. It's part of the the Open Cipher project. Uh, there are lots of other projects that implement Cipher. Uh, different database projects, different processing frameworks. Uh, for example, you can use Cipher on Apache Spark to kick off a, a Spark job. Okay, so back to our tweet. So uh, we said that Neo4j is open source software that stores and queries data. We talked about 
the property graph model with nodes and relationships. We talked about Cypher. And the final bit here is that we do all of this with index-free adjacency. So index-free adjacency is this very important performance characteristic uh, that really separates graph databases from other databases. And index-free adjacency means that we can traverse from one node to any other node that we're connected to without doing an index lookup. So what that means is it means that the performance of a graph traversal is not dependent on the overall size of the data, only on uh, the number of relationships uh, that we're traversing in, in the, the local pattern that we've specified. So this allows us to scale uh, to very, very large data sets. Um, one other characteristic of Neo4j that I, that I want to mention briefly, and, and if we have time, uh, we can go into this in a bit more detail, because I think this, this is really interesting, is the uh, clustering architecture for, uh, for Neo4j. So we can have multiple uh, instances of Neo4j in a cluster deployment uh, to scale out uh, throughput and, and availability. Um, and we basically have core servers that are responsible for handling commits. They use, this uses the Raft protocol for, for consensus. Uh, and then we can scale out reads with additional read replicas. Okay, so what are some common use cases for, for graphs in Neo4j? Well, things like uh, personalization, so uh, real-time recommendations, uh, or product recommendations, things like this are, are commonly uh, done in graph databases. Things like fraud detection, um, working with network and IT management data, uh, master data management, the, the list that we see projects uh, in, in different use cases sort of grows and grows. Okay, so that's, that's sort of an overview of Neo4j uh, and graph databases. Let's jump back to our Russian troll data. Um, so this project started uh, a few months ago uh, working with, uh, with NBC News. And it started with this list of Twitter accounts that Twitter provided to the House Intelligence Committee uh, as part of their investigation into how Russia may have interfered in the 2016 presidential election. Uh, Twitter released uh, almost 3,000 screen names of Twitter accounts that they believed were connected to the Internet Research Agency, uh, which is a company in Russia that has been known to operate uh, social media troll accounts. Twitter immediately suspended these accounts uh, which removed the tweets and the, uh, the profile information from Twitter.com and the Twitter API. So this meant that journalists were not able to look at these tweets, to look at these accounts, to see what they were tweeting about, um, which, which was really, of course, made journalists much more interested to know, uh, okay, what were these accounts doing? Uh, so. The folks at NBC re reached out to us, uh, and we started looking at how we might be able to piece together some of this data. So one of the first things we did was look at uh, Internet Archive. So Internet Archive caches lots of uh, websites. They have an API, so it was pretty easy to write a script to go through each of these screen names to check uh, if their Twitter profile page was ever cached by Internet Archive. Uh, if it was, well, then we could scrape that HTML uh, to grab the tweet information. This was a little bit more difficult because, because it's taken at different snapshots in time. There's lots of different versions of the, the HTML that we had to write scrapers for, but, but that worked. Um, so we ended up with some JSON data uh, that roughly mirrors what you would get from the Twitter API. And one thing that's, that's really nice about Cypher is that we can pass a JSON object as a parameter to a Cypher query. Uh, so this is the import script for importing this JSON data into Neo4j. Basically, we just uh, iterate over this, uh, this list of tweets. We have a list of hashtags, links that are shared, 
and so on. We just iterate over each of those and create different pieces of the graph. So our graph model looked like this. So we have tweet nodes. Uh, we extract out uh, user into, uh, into another node. So uh, a user posts a tweet. That tweet can mention uh, a user. We extract out the hashtags uh, as well as the source, which is the, the application they use to post the tweet, the URLs that they shared, uh, and so on. And this, this was okay. We found, uh, I think, maybe, maybe 1,500 tweets from, uh, from about 100 of the users on the list, so, so a pretty small sample. Um, and, and that was okay. That was enough to get started with. Uh, but it turns out that there were some other folks that had been collecting tweets uh, leading up to the election and just sort of saving those and, and sitting on them uh, for a rainy day. And they were able to cross-reference their, uh, their cached tweets that they had been saving for uh, tweets posted by users on the house list. And they shared that with, uh, with the team at NBC. And we imported uh, this data from a few different sources into one database in Neo4j. We ended up with a few hundred thousand tweets from 454 of the uh, accounts on the house troll list. So remember, there, there were 3,000 accounts on the list. Um, so we only were able to grab just a tiny slice of what these accounts were actually doing. But it was enough to, enough to dig in and, and do some analysis. So looking at the data, uh, we saw, I, I think, three sort of categories of these troll accounts. One is accounts just designed to look like your average American citizen. Uh, so here's Leroy. This is, this is his picture. So this is uh, sort of the, the stereotypical uh, common American. Another group of these accounts were made to look like local news publications. So this is Cleveland Online, uh, bringing you breaking news, weather, traffic and more for Cleveland from St. Petersburg. And the third were actually meant to look like local political party affiliated Twitter accounts. Uh, so this is 10 GOP, uh, which was meant to look like it was affiliated with the Tennessee Republican Party. Um, and of course, it, it was not. These accounts were all operated by uh, the Internet Research Agency in, in St. Petersburg. So, okay, so, so we have this data in Neo4j. Um, the, the folks at NBC had some journalistic hypotheses that they wanted to test. Uh, so we, we wrote some queries to, to make sense of the data. Um, I won't go over everything that, that they uncovered. The, the articles uh, out there on, on NBC News cover a lot of what, uh, what we were able to uncover. Um, but here's, here's one example. So here's a tweet from, uh, from Leroy Loves USA. And he's talking about hanging a banner on a bridge in Washington, D.C. And, and sort of taking credit for that. And that banner actually was hung on a bridge in, in Washington, D.C. Um, and what's interesting here is that we saw uh, a lot of these troll accounts trying to latch on to events that occurred in real life. So you see this, this bridge between troll world and, and reality, uh, which is pretty interesting to, to see. So if we look at tweet volume by day, uh, we can see that a lot of these troll accounts latched on to uh, events that occurred, uh, so things like uh, terrorist attacks, uh, things like when Trump wins the, the nomination, uh, election day, certainly leading up to the election, we see a huge spike in activity. So I think the the uh, takeaway here is that there was a lot of attempt to amplify confusion and division uh, that was going on in, in reality. 
hashtags played, uh, played a big part in this. Uh, a lot of these accounts, when they were initially created, tweeted lots of mundane things uh, with just very common, uh, very normal, but popular hashtags. And this was done to gain visibility, to, uh, to get an initial following uh, once these accounts were created, uh, and then started using hashtags that were a, a bit more controversial. Um, one, one interesting uh, account here is World of Hashtags. So World of Hashtags is one of the Russian troll accounts. And that account uh, was the first one to use the hashtag rejected debate topics. And this was meant to be sort of a hashtag game uh, to encourage others to sort of suggest what are uh, rejected debate topics, uh, things that, that candidates necessarily wouldn't want to talk about. And we found that actually hundreds of uh, non-troll accounts actually started engaging uh, with this account using this hashtag. So hashtags was, were a big way to sort of spread this message and uh, interact with lots of regular users. Uh, replies were, were used as a way to gain visibility. Um, so the, the top accounts that the trolls were replying to with tweets were Donald Trump, and it's cut off here, but the, the second one is Hillary Clinton. And then we can see a lot of uh, news publications on here as well. Uh, and I think this was done mainly as a way just to, to get visibility of these accounts to show up in the mentions of these very popular accounts. One thing that's interesting is we can look at the difference between what we can call original content tweets. So these are tweets that these trolls posted that were not retweeting uh, an already existing tweet. They were not replies to another tweet. They were just original content. And then we have retweets and uh, replies. And if we look at the, the breakdown uh, overall, we can see that the, the vast majority of the tweets that we collected from these Russian trolls were retweets, uh, retweets both of other Russian troll accounts in an attempt to amplify the message, but also of, of normal users. And we can see that some accounts, uh, so in this chart at the top, blue is retweet volume, orange, our original content tweets and red, which we don't actually see very many of our, our replies. And we can see that a lot of accounts were only retweeting uh, and a few were creating lots of original content. Um, this account, this is the, uh, the Tennessee GOP party account that was very active in uh, original content and replies as well. We can look at uh, some of the, the sources. So these are the applications used to post these tweets. Uh, most of these came from uh, the Twitter web client. So going to, to twitter.com, posting a tweet. Uh, but we saw a lot coming from other sort of standard social media tools, uh, things that you can use to schedule tweets to go out uh, at a certain time. Yeah, so, so what's interesting, it, it doesn't seem to be that they have sort of a, a standard, uh, standard tooling to use, because you even see some from, uh, from Android and, and iOS, uh, from, from Medium, Buffer, right? So that, that's one thing that, that I thought was very interesting is, is sort of, like you point out, the diversity of tools used. Well, were they just based that, um, so, so this is more than faking a user agent string uh, because you actually have to use the OAuth credentials for a Twitter application uh, to post that. So I'm not sure what would be involved in faking that, but it would be a bit more complex than just faking a user agent. When we look at the domains of the URLs that were shared by these accounts, um, you see a lot of mainstream uh, publications that were shared. Uh, a lot of them are, are wrapped up in link shorteners, uh, which, we, uh, which we 
went through a little bit of, of expanding these, but didn't do an in-depth analysis uh, of actually unfurling the, uh, the shortened links. But what, what you don't see is a lot of um, obviously fake news uh, that you're seeing here. So if we look at uh, hour of the day that these accounts were tweeting, uh, so this is in UTC time, uh, we see a bit of a spike uh, during Moscow business hours. Um, so despite using, using some scheduled tooling uh, to sort of schedule these tweets to go out whenever, uh, there's a clear spike when uh, we have start of the day in Russia. Okay, so those are some, some sort of basic queries that, that we can run uh, once we have this data combined into the graph. Um, but we can use some more complex tooling uh, to analyze this data as well, things like uh, natural language processing. So there, there are lots of common, common NLP tasks, things like, like language detection, entity extraction, uh, sentiment analysis, um, these kinds of things. And there are lots of great open source tools for working with uh, these NLP tasks. So we don't need to, to reinvent the wheel here. Now most NLP tasks are annotations. Uh, where you're, you're taking some text and you're annotating it with uh, part of speech, uh, annotating with some sentiment, something like that. So how do we annotate uh, data in the graph? Well, we do this by creating new nodes and relationships. So if we were to run an entity extraction on our tweet data here, we would create new person, organization, location nodes connected to the tweet that those entities are, uh, are mentioned in. So that's how we, how we annotate the graph uh, after we do NLP tasks. Okay, so we said there, there are some great open source NLP tools. How do we use these with Neo4j? Well, Near4j is a very extensible database. So we can actually extend the functionality of Cypher with user-defined procedures and functions. So this is a code that's shipped to the database. We can write this in Java or, or any, any JVM language. Uh, there's a standard just, uh, interface that we implement uh, for these procedures, ship them to the database, and then we can call them from Cypher. Uh, so we can actually uh, embed Stanford Core NLP, uh, ConceptNet tooling, things like this uh, in Neo4j that we can call uh, with Cypher. And uh, GraphAware, which is a, uh, a company that does a lot of Neo4j projects, They've built uh, a NLP tool chain that is uh, shipped as procedures for Neo4j. So here we're matching on all of the tweets that we have in the database and we're calling this nlp.annotate procedure, which will then process the, uh, the text of the tweet using, in this case, Stanford Core NLP and will allow us to annotate the graph by creating these additional nodes to represent uh, the result of our NLP processing. So that allows us to look at, okay, what are the most common people mentioned, the most common locations, the most common organizations that show up uh, in this data set. And uh, location is interesting because we, we see lots of, um, lots of these sort of local news uh, accounts tweeting about events that are going on uh, in, these, in these cities. We see lots of uh, political people and political organizations mentioned, so sort of usual, usual suspects there. Uh, but this also allows us to query now in the context of uh, a certain location or a certain organization. So here we're saying, find all of the tweets that uh, are talking about Louisiana, 
uh, and then show us all of the hashtags that are used uh, along with those. And what we can see here is um, that these specific tweets uh, dealing with Louisiana uh, are talking uh, about uh, certain people. So here we can see John Edwards being mentioned uh, and so on. So this allows us to add, add some context to, uh, to the queries when we're exploring the data. Okay, so another, another powerful uh, piece of tooling that we can use to work with uh, this data is this idea of graph algorithms. So there are, uh, there are a few different algorithms that are relevant here. Uh, one is centrality. Centrality is, is this idea of a measure of importance in the network. Uh, page rank is, is one measure. Uh, this is a of course, recursive algorithm that uh, is relative to the importance and number of connected nodes uh, give me my, uh, my importance in the network. Between the centrality is a different measure of centrality. Uh, the definition of between the centrality is simply the number of shortest paths between all nodes in the network that pass through a given node. So in this diagram, we can see uh, the red nodes have a high between the centrality because they're acting as bridges or sort of connectors between different clusters in the graph. And another measure of centrality is closeness centrality. Uh, closeness centrality, or nodes that have high closeness centrality are often highly connected within, uh, within a cluster, but not necessarily outside of that cluster. So lots of different ways to measure uh, centrality. And then community detection or, or clustering, um, they're not quite the same thing, but we'll, we'll treat them as the same thing uh, for our discussion. They're basically different a, uh, a way to segment the graph, to find partitions or communities in, uh, in the graph. And there are lots of different iterative algorithms uh, to do this. Basically, they all work by minimizing modularity, which is the ratio of relationships uh, inside the network to the relationships outside of, uh, of the cluster. Okay, so, um, so how do we run these graph algorithms in, in Neo4j? Um, well, I wanna take sort of a step back and take a look at another uh, Twitter analysis project uh, from a few years ago that uh, a data scientist named John Swain uh, was doing using Neo4j. So he was looking at tweets around uh, popular discussions on Twitter, things like uh, Brexit, things like the, the climate change debate. And he had this, uh, this data pipeline um, that worked, worked well for him. So he would collect tweets, they would go in, into a message queue, then they would go into Mongo, then they would go in, into Neo4j, then he would pull out some subset uh, and run some graph algorithms in R. Uh, and then those would get dumped to MySQL so that he could use visualizations with Tableau, or they would get dumped as GraphML so that he could use Gephi to visualize that. And so he showed us this, uh, and, uh, and we thought, oh, okay, there's, there's a lot of moving parts there. Uh, this, this could be a bit simpler, I think, right? Uh, so, so this was our goal, uh, is to sort of enable the same sort of uh, data pipeline, but removing a lot of the uh, a lot of the moving pieces there. And so, as part of this, we wanted to enable uh, enable the ability to run all these algorithms that he was doing in R uh, directly in the database in in Neo4j. And so, we said that Neo4j is very extensible. We can write user-defined code that we ship to the database that we can call from Cypher. Uh, so that became the framework for implementing uh, these algorithms as, as procedures. So centrality, community detection, pathfinding, these, are, these were the focus for them. And they all share a similar API, uh, which is this idea of calling the procedure uh, from Cypher, uh, either passing in the, the label and relationship type that you're interested in traversing or passing in 
a projection of the graph. And th this piece, I think, is, is really, really important because what this means is that you can define an inferred graph in Cypher, so a, a graph that doesn't actually exist in the data, and you can run graph algorithms on that network. And that's actually, most of the time, uh, what you want to do, because that, that's actually often what you're interested in, are these inferred relationships in the graph. So in, so in graph theory, uh, there's a powerful concept of, of triads, or triadic closure. Um, this is a slight variation of a triad, but uh, you can bear with me on that. So here we have uh, a user uh, here who posted a tweet. And uh, that tweet was a retweet of another tweet that was posted by this user. Okay, so a user retweeted another user. Well, there's an inferred relationship uh, between these two users where one user uh, is, could be said to have amplified the message of the other user. So that's the idea of, of inferred relationships in the graph. So if we want to run PageRank over this inferred uh, amplified relationship, uh, we can do that by defining that inferred network uh, with the Cypher query and passing that to our PageRank algorithm so that we run PageRank on the inferred graph uh, and we end up updating uh, those nodes with a PageRank property, so an additional property that we save. Um, under the hood, there's, there's some efficient uh, infrastructure for running these uh, in, in parallel, efficiently fetching them out of the database and, and writing back in parallel, um, meant to, to take advantage of, of multiple threads and, and the hardware. Um, we, we ran some initial, I wouldn't call these benchmarks, but initial comparisons uh, to Spark, and we found that, okay, it's, it's just as good as, uh, just as good or better on, on similar hardware, and we can do this on, on very large graphs uh, initially. So that's great. Um, okay, so if we run PageRank on this inferred amplified uh, graph, and we can also run community detection on that. Uh, okay, so we're, that gives us trolls that are amplifying the message of other trolls. And then PageRank gives us the most influential uh, of those. Okay, we, we need some way to make sense of that data. Uh, so that's where graph visualization uh, comes in. So oftentimes with graph visualization, we want to be able to bind the size of the node to some property, uh, some attribute of the node. In this case, we use uh, PageRank to determine the size of the node. Uh, color is uh, the result of our community detection algorithm. So here we can see there are three clear communities uh, in the graph. And then relationship thickness gives us some interaction weight. In this case, it's the number of retweets between two users. Sorry, these are communities of trolls? These are the trolls, yes. This, this, so this is a visualization of the amplified uh, that inferred, uh, that sort of retweeted relationship, uh, where trolls have retweeted other trolls. Uh, and then we run community detection on that, and we see sort of three distinct uh, communities. And if we actually look at the hashtags that these communities are using, we can see that the, the red group is talking mostly about more right-wing political things. Uh, the yellow group talking about more left-leaning political things, but not necessarily positively. Uh, and then this purple group, the smaller group at the bottom, is talking almost exclusively about Black Lives Matters hashtags. And when we look at the ones that are, are most important, are most central, um, we have the, the Tennessee GOP uh, is clearly the most influential account uh, within this red group. Uh, yeah. On tweets that are not um, not um, trolls, would also the same um, groups merge? I think. Um, yeah. So the question is, if you did this on just a 
random sample of, of Twitter accounts, not, would, you, would, would you see these terms, same sort of groups emerge? Um, I don't know, I, I don't think so. Um, I think it would depend on your sample, right? So if you, there, there's, some, there's some selection bias in our data set here. If we go back to uh, talking about how we actually got the data, so we said that, well, we got it from people that were caching tweets leading up to the election. Well, we have to assume that they were filtering for some sort of political keywords to know that these were political tweets. So, so there's some bias in, in our selection here. Plus, we're, I mean, we're looking just at the troll accounts. What, what I think would be more interesting uh, to look at, rather than just a random subset of Twitter to look at actually all of the Twitter troll tweets rather than just the ones that we are pretty sure about the election. Um, because we said we only captured tweets from 450 out of almost 3,000. So there's, there's a lot of other interesting data uh, out there. Um, okay, and, and this, this is the tool that we use. It's, it's a simple JavaScript library um, that is intended to work well with Neo4j, so we just sort of configure what property we want to uh, represent node size and, and that kind of thing. Okay, so, um, so the, the MBC team, they wanted to release this data to the public uh, after they had, they had published a few stories. Um, because they wanted this data to be out there so that anyone could sort of dig in to the, the piece that they were interested in. So on February 14th, uh, they released this data set, uh, both as a CSV and then also as a, as a Neo4j database. And then two days later, the Mueller indictment came out. Uh, and the Mueller indictment specifically names the Internet Research Agency and uh, some of its uh, employees for operating uh, troll accounts. But it also specifically names uh, two Twitter accounts that show up in our data set, um, specifically, specifically this big central one right here uh, is named in the Mueller indictment. The, the Tennessee Republican Party account. Uh, and then another account that's named is called March on Trump. Uh, and they found that it was actually uh, arranging actual events that occurred in the US. Um, so the Mueller indictment also lists uh, hashtags that were commonly used that, that show up in the data set. So uh, altogether, I think there are maybe about 4,000 tweets in uh, our data set that are relevant to the, the Mueller indictment. Um, so this, this was a fun project to work on. Um, you know, I, I thought the, the piece about amplifying the message with retweets within the troll network uh, was, was interesting. Um, the, the biggest challenge with this, of course, was data availability um, because all of these tweets had been removed from, uh, from the Twitter API. It was, of course, a challenge to, uh, to get those, but it was, it was a fun project to integrate them uh, and work with them in, in Neo4j. So if you want to play around with this data, um, you can do that using Neo4j Sandbox. So Sandbox allows you to spin up a bunch of different uh, Neo4j instances with different data sets preloaded. Uh, this Twitter trolls data set is one that's available on uh, Neo4j Sandbox. Um, okay, so that's, that's all I have to say about Twitter trolls. So I, I can take some questions. Um, if no one has any questions, I would love to talk about uh, the clustering model in the Air4J. But we'll pause for some questions. Yeah. Uh, this is fascinating. Thank you for presenting. Thank you for doing all this work. And thank you for making it available. Why don't we all talk? Um, <laughs> these lectures are being broadcast worldwide, or webcast. Um, it seems like, in addition to telling us what happened, you're telling the bad guys how to avoid being so easily found the next time. 
Are you concerned about them learning what they need to do differently so as to cover their tracks if they want to do this again? Yeah, so, so the question is, is sort of aren't you, aren't you pointing out um, how to uncover trolls uh, in the future so they can sort of learn from their lesson to not be detected going forward? Sources and methods as being the one key thing they never want to divulge. Yeah. So, um, so no. Uh, and, and the reason why is because if you, if we go back to sort of what was the, what was the origin or sort of the initial um, filter for us to look at all of these tweets is that we were given a list by the House Intelligence Committee uh, and Twitter provided this list uh, to the House Intelligence Committee, and Twitter presumably has some methodology that they use to identify these accounts, looking at, I don't know, IP addresses or something like that. Um, and Twitter has said absolutely nothing about the methodology they used to identify those accounts. Um, so I, I would say that you know that's really sort of the the methodology um, that got them identified in the first place is however Twitter identified these accounts. Uh, and, and we don't really know what that methodology was. For instance, if you were they and you were trying to be less obvious, might you be inspired to use 10 times as many false accounts the next time, or 100 times as many accounts? So as to make the clustering less obvious and the connections less statistically clear to somebody looking at their work. Well, well, again, we, we don't know sort of what Twitter's methodology was for identifying these counts in, in, in the first place. Um, so there's, there's little information available out there on, on sort of how they actually determined that these were the, the Russian troll accounts. Um, and presumably, there's some cooperation with the Intelligence Committee going on um, and, and sort of with, with Mueller's group as well. So I, I, I think... Because we don't we don't know that I, I don't think there's a lot of uh, you know a chance that this is helpful information for for future trolls. Yeah. Yeah. If you did not have this seed information, would you have been able to infer that there was in fact this cluster? All this. Why do you think there's one cluster? <coughs> Twitter is set up to set up troll groups. That's the whole purpose of Twitter. <laughs> I mean, if, if we if we didn't have this initial list to to dig into, um, this project would not be as interesting because you can you can argue sort of all day long whether or not someone is is an actual troll account. Actually, one of one of my coworkers uh, and, and I were talking about this project, and and he had, had mentioned sort of another citizen journalist uh, who had identified hundreds of, of Russian troll accounts, and uh, and my coworker looked at the list. And uh, one of the uh, accounts on the list was a good friend of his sister, not a Russian troll. So, um, you know, I, I think Twitter, there's a lot of, I don't know, burning pile of garbage comes to mind, right, that, that goes on on Twitter. So this, this list is really what made uh, this project possible and interesting. Without, of it, um, without it, I think it would be sort of a lot more uh, supposition type things. Yeah. I've seen people ask that you repost by copying and pasting rather than retweeting. I don't know why that is the case, because I'm not really a, tweet, a tweeter. Mm -hmm. But did you try to detect that kind of behavior also, or was there any of it? Because retweeting is kind of obvious in that it creates that link rather than identical content. Um, yeah. Uh... So I have to be careful in the way that I answer this because um, we we had data in different formats um, that we used to import into our database. Um, some of it had the clear connection, so the tweet IDs that was a retweet of another tweet, um, and some did not. So we we dealt with that um, in sort of a data cleansing manner. Um, well, 
For, for, for a piece of the data, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's not something that we specifically looked for people that were copying and pasting uh, text of a tweet versus retweeting. It's not something we explicitly looked at, but we, we did try to model the case where uh, we believed that a tweet was a retweet of another tweet. Manpower was required. Do you measure that, like man weeks or whatever? Yeah. So, uh, so uh, at, at NBC, there there were a couple of folks um, on on sort of the the data visualization and and the the writing uh, piece of it, um, and then. Uh, we were doing a lot of the, the data import and a lot of the analysis of the data. Uh, and it was myself and, and one of my coworkers uh, sort of uh, part time for uh, a couple months. Yeah. What do you have ideas on what might be done to combat future attacks of this sort? And how service providers or might better be able to detect what's genuine, what's not, what kind of cross-checking can be done, how they might flag or understand suspicious origins based on stuff as it's happening instead of in retrospect. Yeah, so one thing that I don't think is very clear or, or how it's handled on Twitter is when you choose to report something, um, as spam or, or to block a user. Um, that information goes to Twitter and it's not very clear what they do to it. Um, there are actually some, some sort of citizen journalism projects to actually create uh, sort of shared block lists um, so that you, you can uh, sort of see other accounts that your maybe like trusted collaborators have identified as, as potential, uh, potential trolls or potential frauds. So, um, you know, I, I think it, it doesn't help that this data was removed from Twitter and the Twitter API. So, so it's very difficult for folks to learn from, uh, from this experience because these tweets are not available to the, the general public. Um, and you know, Twitter would say that, well, that's our, our standard practice. We, we identified that these accounts uh, violated our, our terms, that they were harmful, so we removed them, we suspended them, and as part of that process, those, those tweets are removed. Um, but that doesn't help people, I think, to sort of get, call it social media literacy, I guess, to, to sort of look back on this whole process and, and see what was going on. So I, I would argue that's, that's maybe part of it, is, um, is sort of making these tweets uh, that we know are tied to the IRA uh, a bit more visible. Do I need to say that again? Twitter. So you know the the NBC folks have talked to Twitter about about getting this data. Um, I work in tech. I know, I know folks that work at Twitter. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it would be. Yeah, I mean it would be it would be great to to chat with folks about this. Um, you know, I, I think there's not a lot of visibility in, in, into this at this point. But yeah, I, I would if you have. Contacts, I, I would appreciate it. I yeah. want to thank, if you have a, a journalist who's interested in writing a book about this access to that data, it would be pretty valuable. So you could show examples of the actual trolls. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. How about this being more of a global thing instead of a US thing? Yeah, so, so this data set um, is focused on the US election simply because, because of the nature of the data that we received, um, that is sort of the focus of, uh, of both what was collected and, and what we're, we're analyzing. But just in the subset that we picked up, uh, there have been uh, journalists in uh, Italy and Germany and the UK that have seen things around uh, like Merkel's election, things around Brexit, uh, things around, uh, I forget the, the controversial political party in Italy um, that, that was caught up in this as well. Yeah, um, and, and so, so you can see that these accounts were targeting not just the US, but doing this globally uh, as well. Yep. And, and, and I think the, the idea was just sort of to spread, uh, spread chaos and confusion uh, as to these different electoral processes. Yeah. Uh, reverse engineering what these people were doing 
from the data. It's a really interesting task. It looks like they were organized in separate teams with content experts working on certain areas. And, and then other accounts were simply focused on amplifying the message of those content creators. But they managed to maintain walls between the teams so there wasn't any leakage between the Tennessee GOP and the Black Lives Matter thing. Yep, yep. And also, um, I was surprised you came to the conclusion that they used extensive automation, which the user agent string diversity would suggest is not the case, rather that they posted all these things manually. Well, I, I think that there was, they were mostly, well, and again, it's the subset that we got were mostly posted manually, but we see some evidence of, you know, automation as well. Also, the subjects that they posted about, if you look at the timeline, there were periods of relative inactivity, and then they would focus on something. Yep. And so there was somebody driving this campaign. Yep, clearly, absolutely. Also, I was surprised that George Soros was one of the targets, because mm. he's not very well known. Well, he's in Hungary. In Hungary, yes, but in the U.S., no, you know, maybe one percent of the people know who George Soros is. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think um, anyone, anywhere that there is a perception of funding, um, I think, led themselves to be targets in in this data set. Oh, the things they didn't talk about. Um, they didn't talk about Russia. Right? Well, um, there's there, there, there's actually the, so the a few hours after uh, the NBC folks released this data set, uh, RT Russia Today uh, broadcast. Uh, they had a a great um, segment where the uh, the anchor was reading through some of these tweets and and she. Uh, picked out a lot of the just sort of mundane tweets where people are talking about uh, like donuts or something like that and saying, okay, cats, right? Yeah, like, like how, how is this supposed to influence the election? I mean, these, are, these are very mundane. And, and then she also zeroed on a few tweets that were actually anti-Russia. Um, there were a couple of them. I think she had, had to look pretty hard to find these. But there were a few that we're, we're talking about. Um, uh, I, I can't remember exactly what they were, but something, something with uh, I think the the DNC email hacking tied to Russia, so, something like that. So, so her her argument was, um, you know, how how can these be Russian troll accounts if they're saying bad things about Russia? Which is very interesting looking at, at sort of trolls talking about other trolls on on broadcast. But yeah, so th th there there was a little bit of a little bit of that, I, and, and really. There, there was a lot of content that was, that was pro-Trump and very right-wing, but there was also there were also things all across the spectrum. It, it wasn't um, just that you know these things were all pro-Trump. There was again a lot of just seizing on emotional uh, issues that were just meant to sort of introduce chaos and introduce some confusion in, in the process and, and really just. Inflame people. There's no NLP tagger for not a native speaker of language. <laughs> so yeah, and, and and looking at Twitter data in, in NLP is actually you know quite a challenge because of just the, the short sample size and a lot of the the Twitter specific thing. There there are some Twitter specific NLP tools that are out there now um, that have been trained on on larger uh, corpuses of Twitter text data, uh, that, which I, I haven't played around with those. Just sort of but seen them out there. Distinctive ticks in the writing, like errors that somebody would, might make. Mm -hmm. Were there any common errors in the texts of multiple Twitter accounts? Um, they were driven by the same person. <clears throat> the, I haven't seen that sort of analysis. There was someone who dug into this data set, and the, there's a there's a specific uh, Russian emoji which is commonly used in Russia. That it's something something like this, like with multiple chins or, or something like that, that, that's commonly used in Russia that isn't, uh, isn't used so much outside of Russia. And they, they found several of these that they thought were, were very interesting. So something that, that kind of ties that in. Yeah. In a character-constrained environment, you could drop at least one 
<laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. So I think you said Twitter identified the 2,752 accounts, and you analyzed some subset of that, I think. Mm -hmm. I presume, for all we know, there might have been thousands more accounts that Twitter wasn't able to latch onto. Whatever yep. their search algorithm was, they might yep. not have found, or whatever it is they were looking for. Yep. Um, do you have thoughts on how you might be able to use some pattern comparisons to check Twitter accounts in general if you had access to the full-blown database and try to find out if there might be 10,000 more that were used in such less frequently, uh, less specifically in ways that they might have been part of the effort but didn't show up on Twitter's scan? Yeah, yeah. So. Um so Twitter actually amended the list uh, just a few weeks ago. They added, I think, an additional 1,500 or so. Although that, that amendment to the list has not been made public. Um, so we still sort of waiting for those to come out. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've thought about it, that there are lots and lots of people that are looking into this now and, and you know, I'll call it sort of citizen uh, journalism, citizen activists. Um, and, and again, that, that example that, that I gave of someone who was, was sure that they identified other trolls and it was you know, a friend of my coworkers. Um, so there's, there's lots of false positives out there. Um, I, I haven't really thought of a I don't know, intellectually honest way to do this. You could, you could certainly look at Building classifiers from from the data, but um, I think the the best way to do this is to actually look at uh, things like IP logs and, and that kind of information that, that Twitter has access to. Um, and, and of course, the, you know there, there are things like Tor and VPNs, but you know th that can be accounted for as well. Um, but yeah, I haven't haven't really made a significant effort to to do that. Connecting to themselves. And yeah, retweeting other <laughs> trolls to sort of amplify the message. Yeah. How do you figure out how much land is coming on uh, uh, purposely or by chance or accidentally or how does that work? Ah, uh, you mean so maybe, maybe sort of average normal users that end up retweeting troll tweets, that that kind of thing, or people that end up interacting with with trolls unknowingly. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I'm not sure. It's not something I thought about. Let's suppose Beyonce was one of the trolls identified. <laughs> if you take something retreated or blocked, even though presumably she's, she's not paying most of her followers. I mean, most. <laughs> <laughs> well, she is fairly rich, so she could pay a lot. Uh, there's, you know, there's a lot of yeah, so you have, you have sort of a. But, well, and I, I think this goes back to when we looked at some of the behavior that uh, these accounts exhibited initially was just sort of very innocuous tweeting, uh, tweeting very common hashtags, things that had nothing to do with, uh, with politics. And our theory is that was largely a way for them to, to gain visibility and popularity, just gain, gain followers and that kind of thing. Um, so that later on, right, that they would become more likely to be retweeted if they have more followers, that, that kind of thing. That's usually so that you don't look like an empty suit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep, exactly. And what I know about being a spy novelist, um, that's in general a way that you, you put agents in place, you have them spend years doing nothing suspicious just as a way of yep. being able to hit them at the one moment when it makes a difference. Yep. Sleeper, sleeper Twitter trolls. Sleeper right? <laughs> Are you shilling for what's that movie, Red Sparrow, which is coming out in two weeks? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm, she didn't, uh, according to the trailer, she doesn't start out innocuous. <laughs> spoilers. Well, in the trailer, the trailers aren't spoilers. And it begs the question, what fraction of all tweet traffic now might just be people establishing cover stories for agents that will emerge in the future? I, I, I haven't been following the news today, but apparently Twitter has been shutting down lots and lots of uh, 
suspicious accounts and bots. Um, so I, I'm curious to, to read about that and, and see if they talk about what their methodology is and what percentage of those they're shutting down. Um, but I know that that's just sort of ongoing today. I just heard about that briefly. Right. Right. You don't want to say how how do I identify a bot because then you'll build a smarter bot, right? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Totally. Want to shut down the mics? <laughs> well, okay. Now we'll shut down the mics, and then you can tell us what really happened. <laughs> <laughs>